So you should know if you're breaking into data science or you're brand new to the field, that you should know a programming language like R or Python. But what does actually writing good code look like? Keep watching, we're gonna talk about that. I'm Richard and this is Richard on Data. <music> writing good code is very important. So you're probably going to work in a team, and if your code is slow or hard to read or whatever, it's going to cause other people problems. In fact, if you work in an environment where there are production requirements, you might end up in a situation where you have to pass your code on to somebody else, and then they have to rewrite your entire code. And trust me, they don't want to do that. And that's not even the worst example. If your code is bad enough, you might just sit on it for a few days and then come back to it and then you won't even know what it does. Now this is not an R versus Python or Julia or SQL or whatever else type of video because that's an entirely separate topic. But instead I want to help provide some guiding tips and principles that are going to help you regardless of what programming language that you're using. Most of these having come from just a little bit of personal experience of my own. But before I do that though, please take a moment to subscribe to my channel if you haven't already and to smash the like button. And then I'll have links in the description of this video to my PayPal account as well as to my crypto wallet addresses. All right, so first thing we're gonna talk about applies to pretty much everything inside and outside of data science, and that's approaching everything with purpose and intentionality. Before you start writing any code for any project, you should ask yourself, this script that I'm about to write, what is it for? Is it to prototype some idea or an analysis? Is it just to play around a little bit so you can get comfortable with your data? Is it going towards some report or some app that's eventually going to a stakeholder? Or is there a production requirement? You'd be surprised even from asking yourself this super basic question, how much time you can save yourself. And in fact, if you're diving into a lengthy kind of analysis, it may even be helpful to think through what the steps of that analysis are before you start writing any code. You have those steps in front of you, and then all of a sudden you can sort of program to a plan. That's something else that'll help you keep whatever you're doing aligned with your purpose. Then the second tip I'm going to give is to minimize things in your code that are inevitably going to have to be changed, whether that's by you in the future or by somebody else if they try to run your code. Your code should be able to stand by itself, and whether you're running it now or one year later, or you or somebody else is running it now, as best as possible, you want to ensure that the code is going to work. Let's give some examples. So let's say it's March 6th of 2022, you're writing code and you need to reference today's date. Well, don't just manually hard code that date, use some kind of function that's going to pull today's date. Don't write code that pulls data from like the desktop on your C drive. That way if somebody else tries to run the code, it's guaranteed not to work. That's just a couple examples, but I hope you get the broader point. Then my next point here might seem like common sense to some of you, but you'd be amazed how often you run into this. And it's to work from top to bottom. Your code, whether it's in a notebook or a script, should be sequential. That is, you start at the top, you run the first code chunk or set of lines of code, then the next, then the next, all the way to the end. Don't write code like this that just obnoxiously goes off to the right. And certainly don't write code where you have to declare some variable or some function all the way at the bottom, then go back to the top or skip around just to get the script to work. Then my next point is just as much for you as for anybody who's working with or reading your code. And that's to use descriptive variable and function names. If you're working with multiple data sets, don't just call them data one, data two, data three. Maybe you make a little subset of data one and call it data one underscore one. No, give it some kind of real name corresponding to what it is. And the same thing goes for functions. Let's say you're writing a function to convert strings to factors. Just call it that. Just call it convert strings to factors. Don't give it some weird acronym like CSTF or something else that's weird that nobody else will understand what it is. Then of course, you don't want to get into the habit of having a whole bunch of unnamed Python scripts and then before you know it, you're working on untitled three version two, a 26 in parentheses, dot IPYNB, but that's an entirely separate issue. 
My next tip is also going to help both you and everybody else out, and that's to use functions in the first place. A good rule of thumb is that if you find yourself repeating code more than once, you probably want to wrap that code inside of a function and then just call that function. Reason being, if you have a bunch of code that just repeats itself over and over, it's very long and hard to read, and it's hard to look at earlier code versus later code and figure out what exactly is different. Whereas if you write that code inside of a function and call that function instead, then when you're reading that code, your focus is going to be on that function and what it's doing and the different arguments to that function. And say down the road, you have to make some change to the process that's going on in that function. If you wrote the function in the first place, you can just make one change instead of having to make that change on multiple different occasions in your code. So it'll save you a ton of time and it'll make it much less likely that you make some kind of silly mistakes. But also, please don't go overboard with chaining functions either. I can't tell you how many times I've been reading SQL code and you've got a select from statement where you're selecting from another select from statement where on the inside it's coming from like six different left joins where each one is its own select statement and it's just messy and impossible to read. And this one is sort of related to my point about working from top to bottom instead of left to right. Granted, a language like R makes this a little bit better because using the pipe operator from the tidyverse framework, the pipe separates one line where there's a function from the next line where there's a function. So you can read that from top to bottom. But if I'm reading like from left to right, a function inside of a function inside of a function inside of a bunch of parentheses, that's really painful. Now my next tip is more of one that's going to help you prevent all kinds of mistakes and errors, and that's to pay close attention to your data types. I'd say if I've written some kind of function or control statement, then I go to run it and there's some kind of mistake or error, the number one most common source of the problem is some variable is not the data type that it's expected to be. An integer is coded as a string somehow, or a date time ended up as a factor, just stuff like that. And this is especially a problem if you're doing any type of modeling activity. So if you're pulling in some data, just take a minute or two up front to make sure that everything is the data type that it's supposed to be. This is one of those things that can save you a ton of time because you may go in to debug what you think is a really complex problem and it turns out it has a really simple fix. Next tip is to provide adequate documentation and comments to the code. If there's some other references or scripts that you're drawing from, provide links to those and just make sure it's obvious as much as possible where those things live. And then please comment your code even if you don't think you have to. If you don't, I guarantee you'll find yourself in a position where down the road you don't even know what your code does. It just makes it a lot easier to understand the workflow inside your code. And it saves you time too because when you go back to look at your code later or somebody else does, you can just look at the comment up above rather than trying to decipher a big chunk of code and figure out what's actually going on there. Tip number nine is to check for the latest and greatest packages in order to do the job you're trying to do. Now there are packages that are deserved staples of their respective languages and probably will be for some time. There's a reason that so many people use pandas in Python or the tidyverse for R. But let's say you're doing machine learning in R, it's just the first time that you've done it in a few years. You might instinctively go to use the caret package, you remember using that from a few years ago, but you totally were unaware that over those last few years, there's been a lot of development on the tidy models suite of packages. And who knows, there's a good chance those packages will be faster, more readable, and give you more options for the task you're trying to accomplish. So if you're doing a task that you haven't done in a while, even if you think you know a really good way to do it, maybe stop and take a half hour or so first and just research all the different packages and methods out there. You never know, there's a lot of development in this space all the time, but it really is on us to keep up to date with it. 
And then my final tip is to test parts of your code as you go. Now, to some extent, this one does come down to personal preference with how much or how little you want to do. But if you're writing 2,000 lines of code without stopping as you go, then you're hoping that you can run it at the end and everything will be hunky-dory. You're just asking for trouble. If you're joining data sets, check after you're done that the format and the number of rows are what you'd expect. And then if you're doing some kind of for loop with some kind of conditional clauses in it, and that's just some piece that's in the middle of your bigger code, check to make sure that you didn't accidentally wipe your entire data set off by mistake. Now this is also related to tip number seven of making sure that your data types are appropriate, but a really good, just easy thing that you can do as you go is just when you have a new data object, use the describe or info functions from pandas or equivalently like the summary or structure functions from R. The earlier you can sniff out problems, the better off you're gonna be. So that covers 10 tips that'll keep you ahead of the pack in terms of programming for data science. Obviously, it's a non-exhaustive list, and it is a little bit general, but I think if you follow these tips, whether you're using R or Python or Julia or something else, you're going to do quite well. So thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, smash the like button, and then let me know in the comments section down below. What are your favorite programming best practices? Want to see me go into more language-specific practices? Let me know. Then I'll see you all in the not-so-distant future. Until then, Richard, on data.